Well, it is a uh, it is a tremendous favor. It's a tremendous privilege to be here tonight with you. You must always be aware that usually the man that is called up front is not the most noble among the men who are gathered. There are men here tonight who know more about the scriptures than I do. Spend probably a great deal more time in prayer than I do. But God is fond of using the runt of the litter. The one is the one that is not as noble and not as wise. Tonight when I look out over this crowd, I see so many things that I cannot do. There are so many needs here. Some of you are truly converted and yet struggle with assurance. Some of you have all the assurance in the world and yet you are without Christ, reprobate, and destined for hell. Some of you need to be taught about prayer. Some of you need to understand the gospel in a better way. None of this is attainable for a man or sermon. And that is why I always say that preaching is one of the most pathetic activities. It is a loss from the very beginning. If a man sets himself to preach about the glories of Christ, he knows he will fail. He himself hasn't even begun to comprehend the glories of Christ, so how could he communicate those glories to another? If as a preacher I desire for you to come to know Christ, I must also understand that you are dead in your trespasses and your sin. And it would be easier, honestly, it would be easier for me to go to the nearby cemetery and command the dead to awaken and to dance to my flute than it will be for you to be saved. This is an impossible task. An impossible task. So let's pray. Father, I come before You in the name of Your Son. Father, we look to You. Eloquence and style are pathetic. power of personality is an atrocity. Entertainment in the pulpit, you hate it. Lord, what can be done for the people who are gathered here tonight? What can be done with this preacher? Father, I cry out to you Help us, Lord. We will be helped. Strengthen us and we will be strengthened. Give us wisdom and we'll speak as the wise. Leave us, Lord. We're destitute. Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit. And that the Spirit of God might manifest Himself here tonight. That the hearts of men might be dealt with properly. Lord, help us in Christ's name. Amen. There are several passages that I would like to execute tonight that I would like to talk about, but I'm going to gather several together as a way of making certain arguments that I think are very, very important for the type and kind of people who are here tonight. Many of you have been raised in something of a Christian culture, and that is a dangerous thing. Western and Christian culture, I would equate it more to a cesspool than I would an incubator producing life. You live in a land of evangelicalism. 
And yet, the term evangelical can no longer even be appropriately applied. Evangelical means anything. We live in a land where there are no absolute truths. We live in a land where doctrine and theology are not important. We live in a land where the individual is exalted above the supremacy of God. We live in a land that not only does not teach the truth, but twists many truths, thinking that it's doing man a favor. We live in a land where big men build big church buildings and ministries on the, unconver on the bones of unconverted church members. To begin the argument, I want us to go to Jeremiah chapter 6. God says this about the leaders, not only the political, but the spiritual leaders of Israel. This is what he says in chapter 6, verse 14. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace when there is no peace. Now you might be thinking right now, but you know, Brother Paul, most of us are young, we're students, or we're, we're people maybe want to understand something more about the gospel, and why are you talking about pastors? I have to tell you why I am talking about pastors. I'm talking about pastors because the spirituality, or the lack thereof, of spirituality in the United States of America is basically the product of unconverted and ungodly and unspiritual pastors and preachers. You are their children. Men who, do, who see no need to be in the Scriptures hours and hours a day. Men who see no need to live on their knees. Men who see no need to do what we're commanded to do in verse 16. Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient path where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. We do not have many men of God today. We have little boys learning marketing techniques and thinking that by doing that, they are advancing the kingdom of heaven and you are their product. You're, you're, you are their children. I was driving here from Virginia, coming through Alabama. Yesterday afternoon, a gigantic sign from, I suppose, a gigantic church that said this, God is not angry with you no matter what you have done. Do you know that's a direct contradiction of Scripture? It's a lie from an evangelical church and probably a Baptist one is a lie. It's heresy. You're the product of that. You came out of that. Many of you were born into Christian families where there was very little Christian going on. You went to church faithfully because you were told that was the thing to do. Your parents went to church faithfully, but you saw little cost Little cross-carrying was more about cantatas and nativity scenes and Easter and pretty children dressed up in pretty dresses and proper suits. It was about being a faithful in your attendance. It was about hearing sermon after sermon after sermon that is, was not scriptural. You were presented a gospel by which you were told, pray this prayer and you will be saved. That's a lie. It's not in the New Testament and it's not in church history. It is a lie. You were taken to Sunday school. You were taught verses. You were made, you made a lot of friends there. You grew up in that church, and if it was large enough, it provided an entire world for you. 
There was youth group that had really nothing to do with scripture. It had more to do keeping the group together by having some wonderful young personality lead them. There were no family devotions. There was no family worship. You never saw your father on his knees in prayer at four in the morning when you got up because you were thirsty and going to the kitchen for a drink. You had pastors who catered to carnal people in order to fill their church with carnal people and they kept having to give carnal people more carnal things in order to keep them there. You grew up in a Christian culture that is not Christian. It's not Christian. Look at the way churches are grown today. I sat down with some supposed leaders of church planting because we were moving to Virginia and some of the young men that work with me and I work with them, they're going to start a church. And I sat down with these exceptional leaders of church planting. I wanted to throw up at the things they were telling us. And then when one of the young men mentioned that he felt like the service would start at 10 o'clock. And the first hour of the main Sunday service would be corporate prayer. That was disdain. You can't grow a church by having the first hour being nothing but prayer. Well, then how are you supposed to grow a church? Entertain them? Have stages with smoke and flashing colors? church in America today is like someone trying to pull a ruse on everybody by taking a dead corpse, attaching strings to it, and making it dance. By putting enough lights directed toward it in just the right way so you don't see the pallid face of death, but there appears to be the rosy cheeks of life. It's a ruse. And you young people, you're the product of it. Are you Christian? Jesus said that many would come before him on that day. And he would say, depart from me. I never knew you. But Lord, depart from me. I never knew you. He said also that many would find the path to death. But few would find the path to life. Now the problem with that text and the modern day interpretation of it is this. We're not hearing him. He's not saying that there is this gigantic world, there's this population of six billion people and only a few of them will be Christian. That's not what he's saying. He's saying among those who call themselves to be my disciples, among them, those who say, Lord, Lord, few will find the path. There are people here tonight who believe themselves Christian when they are not Christian. And if you went to your pastor with a troubled soul, instead of knowing how to deal with your soul, he would pronounce peace, peace over you, and the very man who is supposed to lead you to glory is the one who damns you to hell. Because he is so ignorant of the gospel and has no ability to deal with soul. Now that is a warning. I do not say it for its shock value. I say it because it is true. Somebody needs to say it. This whole thing is going down the drain straight into hell and the ones primary responsible are the ones who are in the pulpit every Sunday. And I have one opportunity, for, one opportunity tonight to stop you from going down that drain. Now, first of all, just briefly, I want to go over the gospel with you. And then we're going to talk about a lost theological truth. Now, first, the gospel. How can I summarize the gospel? I could say something like this. Do you want to go to heaven? And if you nod your head, I can say, well, then pray this prayer and ask Jesus to come in. And after you pray, 
I can say, were you sincere? And if you tell me yes, then I can popishly pronounce you to be converted. That's what would happen in 99% of the churches in America. I will not do that to you. What is the gospel? It's good news. It's very good news. But it's only very good news to a terrified man. It's only very good news to a needy man. You see, what you need to understand... Well, let, let me put it this way. Just to cut straight to the chase. Let me tell you the most terrifying thing that I can possibly tell you. The most terrifying truth that I can speak to you. Are you ready? Here it is. The most terrifying thing I can tell a man a woman, a child, is this. God is good. I said that a few years ago over in Europe when I was preaching. A secular university. I said, if you want to get down to it, the most terrifying news for man is this. God is good. And someone kind of laughed and said basically, and what's the problem with that? The problem with that is you're not good. Now, what does a good God do with someone like you? That's the greatest theological and philosophical problem in the Scriptures. God is good and that is terrifying. A hardened criminal working for some crime organization if before he goes to court, he is told that the judge is corrupt, he is full of joy. The most terrifying thing you can tell that criminal is the judge is not corrupt, he's good. It will fill him with terror. And see, this is the greatest problem of mankind. The greatest problem of mankind is God is good. Don't you see that? Because you're not. And therein lies the problem with modern day evangelical preaching. No one tells you who God really is. They just speak in cliches. You see, the other preachers can tell you God is good and you walk out feeling like you're totally released from any responsibility. I want to tell you that God is good and you ought to be terrified because you are not good. And there's the second half of the problem. No one's telling you what that means either. What does it mean that you're not good? How non-good or ungood are you? Let me put it this way. If you reject Christ, then the moment you take your first step through the gates of hell, the only thing you will hear is all of creation standing to its feet and applauding and praising God because God has rid the earth of you. That's how not good you are. You say, but my sin, I'm not that big of a sinner. Adam sinned once and threw the entire universe into total chaos and condemnation. You do not understand who this God is. He really is good. You're not. He really is love. You are the very opposite of that. So how can he let evil, loveless people into fellowship with him? Well, why can't he simply forgive? Because he's just. You see, you were grown up in a culture where there is no justice. There's no pastor writing books like Lex Rex, The Law of the King. There's no one speaking about justice biblically. You see, God is just. And the greatest theological problem in the Bible is this. If God is just, He cannot forgive you. Do you hear me? If He's just, He cannot forgive you. Unless first His justice is satisfied. And that is what happened on the cross. That's why the cross is everything. It is absolutely everything on that tree. The only servant that Yahweh has ever had hung there. A perfect man. 
and the sins of God's people were cast upon him. And all the wrath, God's holy hatred for evil, for sin, for the wicked, Everything that should fall down upon your head throughout all of eternity fell down upon the head of God's only beloved Son. Every Easter Sunday I hear people preach about, you know, nails and spears and crowns of thorns and go through the medicals, you know, medical examiner's interpretation of the cross. And all that is important. It had to be a bloody death. But what they don't understand is they haven't preached the gospel. You're not saved if you're saved because the Romans beat up Jesus. If you're saved, it's because His own Father crushed Him under the full force of His wrath. Because someone had to pay for you. It was Him. People tell me, they say, well, you want to preach the gospel tonight? Yes, well, we understand that. No, you don't. If Ian Murray was here right now, if I could raise Jonathan Edwards from the dead, if Charles Spurgeon were to walk through the door, they would not profess to know the gospel in its fullness. And yet we've reduced the gospel down to four spiritual laws or five things God wants you to know, and you all think you know it. You will spend an eternity studying the gospel and you will not even have reached the foothills of the glory of the thing. It's the gospel. God reconciling the world to himself. God being just and not simply being able to turn his back or look over sin. God who must deal with the sin of his people. He must satisfy his justice in order to appease his wrath. And he does that by the death of his only son having suffered the wrath of God. And on the third day, rising again from the dead. And that resurrection did not, did not make Him the Son of God, but it was God's public declaration of several things. First of all, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Romans 1. Then you make your way over to Romans 4. What does it mean? That resurrection was God's sign that He had accepted Christ's death as atonement for the sins of His people, whereby they could be justified. Then Peter tells all the outraged leaders of the Jewish nation, this resurrection from the dead proves that this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. And the apostolic proclamation, the invitation for you to come to Christ, is not, would you like to pray this prayer and ask Jesus to come in? The apostolic proclamation is this, God commands all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. And preachers will tell me, what if you just tell them that and you don't give them something to do, then how will you know that they are saved? Because their life will change. I can go to most people in every tavern around this place tonight, and some of them really good church members. I can go there and ask them, are you saved? And they will say yes. I can go to most Southern Baptist colleges where the kids are beer bonging and go, are you saved? And they'll say, most certainly we are. Why? Because one time, some preacher who should not be preaching the gospel led them in a sinner's prayer and pronounced over them that they were converted dealt with their soul possibly two or three minutes. No, my dear friend, no. You are saved by repenting of your sins. You are saved by believing the gospel and the evidence that you have repented unto salvation and that you have believed unto salvation is that you continue repenting and continue believing. Now, I want to come to something that is, is a lost doctrine. I know there is a great debate today 
There's Calvinism and Arminianism and all these different things, and they are important arguments. But people will often ask me, they say, Brother Paul, you're more kind of Calvinistic or this or that. I tell people, well, I'm a five-point Spurgeonist. And they say, you're more Calvinistic, this guy's more Arminian. How is it that you love Leonard Ravenhill so much? Because he was definitely an Arminian. How is it that you love Tozer so much? Why? He said, because we have this in common. We believe in the doctrine of regeneration. And that is the lost doctrine. And not only lost the evangelicals, it's even lost among reformed people and everyone else. And what is that doctrine of regeneration? Let's just look real quick in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17, a verse that is heard over and over and over again, but not properly understood. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, what is he saying? Well, just hold your place and go to Galatians. And look in chapter, chapter 6, verse 15. For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. The word can also be translated a new creature. What is he talking about? Here's what you need to understand. Young person, look at me. This is so important. You are not a sinner simply because you commit an act of sin. You commit acts of sin because you are sinners by nature. You are sinners by nature. And you have no idea how truly wicked that people are as they are born into this world. You say, well, Brother Paul, people do a lot of good things. Listen to me. What you need to understand, and history teaches us quite well, you look at Hitler, you despise him. You scoff at him. But know this, even Hitler's evil was restrained by the common grace of God. And if it had not been for the restraining hand of God, Hitler would have been far evil. But now here's what you must understand. The only reason you do not make Hitler look like a choir boy is the common grace of God restraining your evil. One of the greatest problems in evangelicalism today, and it causes all sorts of problems with eschatology, with the doctrine of hell, and everything else, is we simply do not understand the fact that men are evil. They are evil. It's not that they do evil things only. It's not that they're influenced by an evil society. They do not come into this world innocent. They are evil. We are evil by nature. And if you have not become a serial killer, if you have not become some, some atrocious monster like Hitler, it is the grace of God restraining your evil. Why does he do that? In order for a work of redemption to be carried out in human history. If God was to pull back, we'd self-destruct in a matter of moments. I also believe that on the day of judgment, what you are going to see is the common grace of God that has held the evil of unconverted men in check on the day of judgment, that will be pulled back and you will see men for what they truly are. And that is why even parents, on the day of judgment, when the common grace is removed from their unconverted children and they see the monsters that they truly are, they will raise their hand and swear that the judge of all the earth has done right by condemning their own children. We are evil by nature. In order for men to truly be saved, two things must happen because there are two problems and they are dealt with in two doctrines. First of all, how can an evil man be right with God? That's the doctrine of justification. On the cross, our sins were imputed to Christ. He was legally declared to be guilty and he was treated as the guilty party. And when he died, he paid for our sins. Justification. And his righteous life is imputed. 
justification. But now here's the other doctrine. There is not only the doctrine of justification, there is the doctrine of regeneration. Those who have truly believed unto salvation have been regenerated by the Spirit of the living God, and that's what Paul is talking about here. They have become new creatures. They have not just turned over a new leaf. They have not just been brought in from their birth into some sort of a southern Christian culture by which they learn the do's and don'ts of that culture. No, they have literally become on the inside new creatures with new natures. Now let me show you how it works. If a nature is evil, it then has evil affections. And those evil affections drive it to do evil things. Now, is that you? Are you filled with evil affections? Oh, you may have just enough religion to cage you, but in fact you hate that religion. And if no one's looking, you'll bust out of that cage so fast and do as much evil as you possibly can. If you have evil affections, you long for evil. It means you have an evil heart and you have not been born again. Ever since the 50s, in the mass evangelism of the 50s, here's what we've done. We've taken the doctrine of regeneration, the doctrine of what it means to be born again and turned it into the hour of decision. If someone made a decision in an evangelistic meeting, it was said of them, you're born again. That is not true. Born again is a supernatural recreating work of the Spirit of God in which more of the divine power is manifested than in the very creation of the universe. Because He created this universe ex nihilo, out of nothing. But when He saves a man, when He regenerates him, He takes a mass of corrupt humanity, He takes out that heart of stone, puts in a heart of flesh, and makes a new creature. Are you a new creature? Don't talk to me about praying a prayer. Don't talk to me about church attendance. Don't talk to me about some collegiate Baptist group. Are you a new creature with new affections that drive you to want to do things that are pleasing to God? That is the question. Are you filled with sensuality? Carnality? I sometimes get on my, I do a Twitter thing in which I put just truths about the gospel. And sometimes I look at the people following me on Twitter. And they're, they're dressed in such a way I can't even look at their picture. They say things I can't even believe. This is evangelicalism today. Sensual, carnal, unconverted people that have just enough deceptive religion to drive them straight into hell. Are you that kind of person? Or do you have new affections? Let me give it to you an illustration I've used quite often. Because it shows this idea of affection, but it also shows something else. How dull the spiritual sensitivity of pastors has become. Let's say a new pastor comes to a church and someone comes up to him and says, you know, brother, uh, one of the first things we'd like you to do is visit Bob over here. He hasn't been to church in five years. The pastor goes over there and says, hello, Bob. Bob invites him in. Sit down, pastor. Sits down. Would you like some tea? Sure, that'd be wonderful. Then the pastor begins, Bob, I understand you haven't been in church in about five years. Bob says, you're right, Pastor, I haven't. Just haven't been going to church, and you're right. I, I need to go to church. I need to do the right thing. And he goes, and Bob, and I, I understand that you've, you know, you've uh, had some trouble with your wife. You've been unfaithful to her. You're still remaining that way. He says, yes, yes, Pastor, you're right. You're right. I'm wrong. You're right. I just need to stop that. You know, I just love the nightlife, but I need to stop it, and I need to get, need to get back to church. I need to do the right thing. Okay? And I, I hear you've been out public drunkenness. 
Yep, I, I just love that liquor, Pastor, but you're right. I just need to throw it away and I need to come back to church. I need to do the right thing. And so the next Sunday morning, Bob walks in the church. And everybody says, Praise the Lord, a sheep has come home. No, it hasn't. A goat just walked into the church. Because do you know what Bob is saying? Bob is saying this. You're right, preacher. I need to stop doing all the wicked things I love and I need to start doing all the righteous things I hate in order to save my own skin. There's no affection. He's the, Paul says this is garbage. Circumcise yourself or don't circumcise yourself. I don't care. None of that is evidence of conversion. Are you a new creature with new affections? I remember one time preaching years ago in Europe and I had a translator and I said, if you're a Christian, you are allowed to do anything you want. The translator, I understood, he, it's a Latin-based language, I understood enough of what he was saying to understand he didn't say what I told him to say. And I said, translate it. He said, I can't translate that. I said, translate it. Trust me on this one. So he translated it. And what does that show us? He had a wrong understanding of conversion. It's not that a believer will not struggle with wrong desires. But it is this. If you truly are a believer, you are a new creation. And you have new desires. And when you give in to those desires of the flesh, it makes you want to vomit. You hate yourself. You loathe yourself. Because you have been changed. You are a new creature. He says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Now, I want to look at something else that is extremely important. I was out uh, a few months ago. And um, was out in California. I got the opportunity to talk to Dr. MacArthur. And, and we were talking back and forth. And I said, you know... You know, you get a, in a lot of trouble for the Lordship salvation thing. And he said, you too. And I said, but you know, Dr. MacArthur, I said, they're wrong. It's not about Lordship salvation. He goes, you're right, it's not. He said, I didn't put that title on there. It's not about if you truly believe, you'll follow Jesus as Lord. What it's about is this. If you've truly believed, you have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and you have become a new creature and you're just going to follow Jesus as Lord. If you miss the regeneration part, you turn it into legalism. It's not, I truly believe and in order to be saved, I'm going to prove I really believe by doing a whole bunch of good stuff. No, that's not what it is. I truly believe because my eyes have been opened and I see Christ, but my heart has also been transformed so to have righteous affections. And when I look on the perfect righteousness of Christ, I'm irresistibly drawn to Him. I want Him. I must have Him. And when in my foolishness and in my flesh I turn away from Him, I hate myself. That's the difference. I want you to look at something. Go over with me quickly to the book of James. Go to chapter 2. Now before I read it, I want to read you this from the Apostle Paul. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. If he had had my English literature professor in college, he would have flunked with this passage. He is redundant, 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 repeating, repeating over and over. And what is he repeating to men? It is not through works. 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 And so therefore, when James says faith without works is dead, 
There is a great contradiction there unless we have the doctrine of regeneration. The doctrine of what it means to be born again. Now look what he's saying. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, verse 14, but he has no works, can that faith save him? That's a rhetorical question. James soundly answers it. No. No. If you don't have works, you're going to hell. That's what he's saying. Well, then he contradicts Paul. Absolutely not. Let's go on. If a brother, now he's going to give us a proof. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? And his whole point is this. Someone comes to your house, they're starving to death, or they're ill-clothed, or they're dying, and you say, just be warm. I wish you the best. He's saying that's utter hypocrisy. You're the biggest hypocrite on the planet. And then he goes on and says, and so it is with faith. You say you believe? And you have no works? Your faith is hypocritical. It's, it's unreal. It's, it's wrong. It's not true, saving faith at all. He goes on to say, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But Paul just got through saying that it's faith alone. And James is saying, no, it's not faith alone. So what is actually being said? Verse 18 clears it up for us. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith. Show me your faith without the works. And I will show you my faith by my works. Now, the important word here is show, demonstrate, prove. Now what he's not saying is this. He's not saying you must believe in Christ and then work with all your might to prove that your faith in Christ is genuine. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying... If you truly have believed in Christ, you have been regenerated by the Spirit of God. And the regenerating work of the Spirit of God, the continuing work of the Spirit of God, the providence of God in your life, which also includes discipline, is going to ensure that every child of His produces new works. That's what He's saying. Works are not additions to faith. They are the fruit of it. How many times before I was converted, I would be ashamed of my activities. Things I would do. A horrible sinner in the university. And swear to myself and pledge allegiance to my friends that I would never do such a thing again. And then strive with all my might not to fall into that. And yet the next night, I'd be doing the same thing all over again. Until one day Jesus Christ met me in the library of the University of Texas. And I was converted. I was regenerated. I became a new creature. Yes, it was sometimes three steps forward and five steps back. It was struggle. It was shameful. It was horrible. It was growing pain. It was all these things. But I was a new creature. You do not see apple trees out there in the orchard twisting themselves and groaning and trying to force apples forth. They have apples because of what they are. You have fruit and works because of what you are, a new creature. That's why the, the being born again is equated with resurrection, newness of life, all these things. My pleading question to you, young person, is do you have a cultural Christianity that is like a, a coyote in a cage? Anywhere there's a loophole in the rules, you'll find a way to escape to do something sinful. Or 
Or are you a new creature who genuinely desires Christ? Who has a new power over sin? Whose desires have been changed? He goes on and he says this in verse 19. You believe that God is one? You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. This is prophetic sarcasm. In love, but sarcasm nonetheless. And what is he saying? To say God is one, that was the most theologically correct statement you could make as a Jew. The equivalent today in Baptist life would be, I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my heart when I was nine. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I prayed that prayer. I can't tell you how many times I'm preaching on the streets or witnessing. And I have good Southern Baptists walk up to me and go, I done did that. What? Don't worry about it. I know, I know, I'm in sin right now and I'm doing all this wicked stuff and everything. But I done did that. I'm okay. That's what's being communicated from pulpits. I done did that. I'm okay. I done did that. I'm okay. I believe. And you can't say that I don't. No, but I can preach the Scriptures to you and they can convict you of sin. Look at what James is saying. He says, you believe God is one. You believe in the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You believe that? Great. Demons believe it. And they give a more proper response than you do. At least they tremble when they hear it. You believe in Jesus? Yes, yeah, so do the demons. You think Jesus is Savior? So do the demons. You think Jesus is Lord? So do the demons. But their piety far exceeds yours because they tremble when they hear that. It comes out of your mouth like it was something from the Disney Channel. He's saying, don't come to me with proclamations of faith and don't come to me with theological proclamations that are correct. He says, because I'm not going to buy it. And then he goes on and he says this, but are you unwilling to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? And he'll spend the rest of the time speaking about this matter. My dear friend, listen to me. The true Christian, the godliest of Christians, will struggle with the flesh. They'll struggle with sin. They'll struggle with the world. They'll struggle with the devil. In the most pious life, you will see men mourn over their weaknesses. But this is not the same thing as what we have in America today. Where people flagrantly are living in sin, doing all sorts of things in the name of Jesus and believing themselves born again. Churches being built on entertainment because Christ is not enough. Because people in those churches don't want Jesus. They don't want truth. They want friendship, community, fellowship, and that's exactly what the pastors are learning to give them. I go to a website, and when all I see on that church website is a bunch of smiling faces of a happy community, I know their theology is really bad. You say, why? I'll tell you what. What are they promoting? Christ is over there in the corner, a tiny little thing. The drawing card is our loving, wonderful, affirming community. I was preaching with one of my, one of my few heroes of the faith that are still alive, Conrad and Bewe, a few years ago, from Africa. And he was, boy, he was going at it. I was sitting on a third row. I'm his friend and I was scared. And he said, these preachers with all their gimmicks and their drawing cards and entertainment and fog on the platform and everything else, 
He goes, when the apostle Paul wanted to plan a church, he took a card out about this big and wrote the most scandalous, horrible thing he could possibly write on it. Christ crucified and he walked down the center of the city. Therein lies the power of the gospel. People say the gospel has no power. No, the gospel has plenty of power. It's just few preachers know it. And any time you rest upon the arm of the flesh, you will see an increase diminishing in the power of preaching and the gospel. It's all about the gospel. And it's all about lives that have been changed and are changing. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians is one of my favorite letters in the entire Bible. And the first chapter is oftentimes so overlooked. It is an amazing, amazing chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I w I'm just going to take you step by step. Look in verse 4. Paul says, Knowing brethren, beloved by God, His choice of you. This is very important. The word choice, chosen, is very important for a Jew. He's talking to a lot of Gentiles here, but he's a Jew and he's using this kind of language. He's saying, we know you're the people of God. We know it. Now, we have two options here. How did Paul know? How did he have such certainty that these people were truly the people of God? That they had truly been converted? That they were truly Christian? There's only two possibilities. One is some sort of revelation. Jesus came to Paul in a dream. But that's not what it says. What does it say? He says, Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, His choice of you. Verse 5. How did He know that God had chosen them? For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. I submit to you that most preachers, their only desire is to see something in word only in their preaching, and their only desire from the people who supposedly come forward, their only desire is also word only. Pray the prayer. You pray that prayer, you're in. You, you, you pray that prayer. Pray and ask Jesus to come in. Pray and have Him come in. And if the devil starts bothering you, will you just take, take Him to the back of your Bible where you wrote the date? Right here. That's superstition. That's Catholicism. That's word only. I have seen evangelists, I have heard supposed good Baptist evangelists say things like, would you like to be saved? Yes. Well, then ask Jesus to come into your heart. Well, how do I do that? Well, just pray and ask Him to come in your heart. Why? Well, I don't know. I mean, how do I do that? Well, I'll pray. I'll lead you in the prayer. Well, I don't know. I kind of feel uncomfortable with that. Well, I tell you what. I'll pray the prayer for you and if you agree with what I'm praying, squeeze my hand. Behold the power of God. And that's practiced every day in America. Every day. Someone comes to a preacher and says, I don't know if I'm saved. And the preacher says, well, let me ask you, was there a time in your life when you prayed and asked Jesus to come in? Yeah. Well, were you sincere? Yeah, I think so. Then you're saved. It's just the devil bothering you. Has it come to that? Has our ability to deal with souls come to that? Is that all we have? It would be better that we all become, I don't know, dentists or pony trainers or something. But don't be spouting out these lies. Paul says, I know that you've been chosen. How? Because the gospel came to you in power and in the Holy Spirit. Now what does that mean? Does it mean that Paul, there was some great manifestation of the Holy Spirit that night? Possibly. That there was weeping and, and, and repenting and all sorts of things going on? Possibly. But we also know that a person can weep and cry and beat their chest and say they believe and still fall away demonstrating that they were never truly converted. So how did Paul know that the Gospel came to them in power? Look in verse three, uh, verse 9. 
He says, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. They turned away from their idols to serve a living and true God. Have you done that? See, here's the problem. In most churches, you don't have to do that. You can keep your idols. Because evangelical churches are filled up with idolaters. You can keep your idols and still have Jesus. No, you can't. You say, Brother Paul, well, are you free of all your idols? No. Well, then what? Ezekiel 36, God's new covenant promise, I will cleanse them from all their filthiness and all their idols. For the last 30 years, there's been the providence of God working in my life, not only teaching me, but disciplining me, breaking me, tearing me apart, zealously watching over me so that He will tear me limb from limb to make me holy. And when I do turn back to an idol, or the head of one pops up, a small fox ruining the vineyard, God will rip it to pieces because He is zealous and jealous for His children. But if you can run wild and give yourself to your idols, if there's never any breaking of any idols, no growing in holiness, you are unconverted. But see, today, there is no call. Christianity. Just pray the prayer. Just walk the aisle. Join the community. Smile with us. He says, no. You turned to God from idols. You turned away from idols, but with what purpose? To serve a living and a true God. You see, you need to understand, holiness is not just that you stop doing all the bad things God hates. Holiness is that you lay those things down so that you can run to Him because you want Him. True holiness is love for God. Is love for God to love what God loves. And since the greatest object of God's affection is His Son, then true holiness is what? greater and greater love for the Son of God. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And look what it says. And to wait for His Son from heaven. To wait for His Son from heaven. I've heard people after a message on eschatology, the second coming, I've heard people walk out and go, oh, I hope it's not tonight. There's so many things I want to do. He says, wait for His Son. My wife told me she's going to write a, a sequel to the book, Marriage to a Difficult Man. She said, married to a very difficult and very strange man. She says, sometimes you know you just get that weird look in your eye. And I know you're just going to go up and sit on a hill. Just look at the sky. Do you desire Christ? I ask people when I am trying to help them discern with the Scriptures about repentance in their own life, I will ask them, the Christ that you ignored, do you now see yourself esteeming Him? See, the evangelical questions given in all those silly books are, do you want to go to heaven? That means nothing. Everybody wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there when they get there. The question is not, do you want to go to heaven? That's what political theory is about. That's what utopianism and everything else is about. Do you want to go to heaven? I want to have a heaven now, they say. And you can have your best life now, according to the preachers. That's not what Christianity is about. It's not, do you want to go to heaven? The question is, do you want Christ? How do I know that your heart has been regenerated? You want Christ. You want Him. You want to know Him. And you hate it when your heart grows dull.
He says, this is what you did. How else did Paul know? Look at verse 4. And you also became imitators of us in the Lord. He said, you became imitators. In this case, the Lord and His apostles. You became imitators of the Lord and you became imitators of godly men. You became imitators of godly women. Most young Christians today, even the ones that scream hallelujah and go to all the Christian concerts and wear the Radical Jesus t-shirts, I look at them and I go, you've bought into a so-called Christian version of the world. You do everything the world does. You try to dress like them, act like them, talk like them, everything else. It's just a little cleaner. It's not Christianity. Some of you look more like Justin Bieber or whatever his name is than you do Jesus. Imitators of Christ and imitators of godly men and godly women. But you go into Christian bookstores and they're, they're finding all the famous people in the world and figuring out how can you take as much of what they got and still not be rude with regard to Christianity. What is this? No one says anything. No. You are called to imitate godly people. You're called to imitate Christ. But here's another problem. We don't allow that to happen in the church. Most of you have never had the influence of a godly person in your life, a godly adult. And it's because of the way the churches are done. They group you in Sunday schools. They put you in children's church. So what happens? You never come in contact with an elder. You're just like Proverbs 13.20. The one who walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Your peer group, you were told and your preachers believe it, that you're supposed to be grouped together. That children are supposed to be with children and teenagers are supposed to be with teenagers and all these other things. And that is not biblical. And I'll stand against anyone who says it is. It's not biblical. Young people are to be with godly, mature adults so that they stop acting like fools and stop influencing one another. One empty head leading another empty head. But Christianity is seeking to imitate, not the world, not, a, not Christian concert people, but godly men and women, mature believers. To find their example and to follow it, to walk in their paths. To realize that basically, children, listen to me. We are, compared to the past cultures, cultures that in the past have been influenced by Christianity. I mean, even the secular authorities are calling us a trite and pathetic and superficial people. Don't you know? And so we remain trite and superficial and most of you boys spend more time playing with Xboxes than you do reading Scripture. And you're little boys with calluses on your thumbs and none on your hands. All because culture has come in. But you're not called to do that. You're called to be imitators of Scripture. To actually get into the Scriptures and figure out what it says. And some of you boys who read the Bible, all you read is Romans 9. You don't read anything that calls any challenge to your life to come and die. Just get in deep theological discussion. That's why Reformed guys read the epistles, but they don't read the Gospels. They don't want the challenge of them. Come and die. Follow me. Become imitators. That is why young people listen to me. Read old books. Read about a time when Christian men were men. 
And Christian women, well, women, go into the scriptures. Look at Christ. Stop this. You're a product of your culture, and someone needs to tell you that as that, you are useless to God. I was preaching one time in a small town, 10, 20,000 people, and there was a kid sitting on the front saying hallelujah and everything else. And he had every kind of paraphernalia on his head and body, and he was the coolest human being that ever walked the planet. So afterwards, I talked to him, and he came to me, and he said, well, you need, you need to understand, Brother Paul, I work on the streets. I said, I've been through this town. How many streets do you have? He said, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching. I said, young man, listen to me. I worked in inner city Dallas and Fort Worth all throughout my seminary year. My last year, I lived with the street people. I was a farm boy from Illinois. I wore canvas Converse All-Stars, jeans from Kmart, and I, I didn't have crosses tattooed on my forehead, and nobody cared. All they cared about was when they got thrown in jail, I would try to go get them. When they would OD, I would be in the emergency room. When they needed a place to sleep, they could sleep beside me. You're not going to win the world by being relevant. You think you're going to win the world because you got their approval? You win the world not because you're like the world, it's because you're not like the world. You let them set the standard and then you baptize it and call yourself a cool, culturally sensitive Christian. And modesty and dignity and true beauty is thrown right out the window as you adopt their grunge and go right down the drain with them. That is not the way to be. Not at all. He says you became imitators. Not only that, look at verse 3. Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and your labor of love and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. How did He know they were converted? Their work of faith. They were laboring for Christ. They were laboring for Christ. And that labor was a labor of love. And they were steadfast, hoping in Christ, looking to Christ, believing in Christ. Christ was everything in their life. I hear preachers today and they say something like this, especially when they have a large church of yuppies or whatever they call them now. They'll say something like this. They'll go, you have a wonderful life. You've got a, you've got a great job. You've got a beautiful wife. You've got two kids. Your home is beautiful. You're driving nice cars. You've got brand name clothing on. You've got a great life. You just lack one thing to make it all complete. You need Jesus. I loathe that kind of hate it. The truth of the matter is you have nothing. You have nothing. And all that you do have will just accuse you on the day of judgment. Without Christ you have nothing. Christ is everything. He's everything. He's everything. In 6 he says, so you became an example to all the believers. Now there are all kinds of passages throughout the Scriptures that talk about this. That in order to be brought to God, you must be justified. You must be legally declared right with Him. And that happens only through faith in Christ who on that tree carried your sin was treated legally as guilty before His Father and crushed under the wrath of God. You need to be justified. But the evidence that you have truly been justified is that there is evidence of regeneration. That you have become a new creature. And that the providence of God has taken hold on your life. Listen to what Paul says. He says, I'm confident of this very thing that He who began a good work in you will complete it, will perfect it, will finish it. That is untrue in most evangelical churches today. That is untrue in most Baptist churches today. That they did the initial thing, but there's no going on with Christ. 
Never forget this. The evidence of justification is sanctification. The evidence you have truly come to know Christ is that he who began a good work in you will finish it, that he jealously and zealously takes hold of your life. If you are without discipline, the writer of Hebrews says, then you are illegitimate children. Please understand me. Young people, listen to me. You must get back to Scripture. And you must learn to study the Scripture also in the context of, of all the men and women of God that have gone before you. Just look out through history. The men and women of God that have been most pious most given to the gospel, most used of God. Study the scripture, but concern yourself with that great history that's gone before you. And when you do, you will see that the Christianity in America today is nothing. It is a mess. With no piety. full of sensuality, carnality. Why? Because we're trying to make a bunch of goats act like sheep instead of preaching the gospel that the Spirit of God might regenerate men. And those of you who are Christian, culture is not to set your standard. You do not adapt to culture and figure out the best way to get in. When Paul said he became like all men, he wasn't talking anything about what you think he was talking about. Please. Look, I don't come to places to preach, and I don't come to places so people can grade me on my proper ability to preach. I want to see you change. I'm screaming at you that this whole mess of Christianity in America is wrong. Now, if I said it was wrong because I got a new way to go, then you should realize I'm a cult leader. But if I say it's wrong because I point back to 2,000 years of Christian history and I tell you I can't find anything like us there, now I have some clout, don't I? When I tell you that all the men of God that are honored on both sides in every camp, when all the men of God, if they were to resurrect and come forth in America today, they would rip your churches to pieces. And even those of you who would honor Whitfield, you wouldn't let him preach in your church. Judgment is coming like nothing you could ever have imagined. And it's not, become, not coming because of liberal politicians or political conspiracies. Because of what's being called the Church of Jesus Christ, and it is not. It is because His name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of this ridiculous evangelical circus in the United States of America. And you're going to have to make a decision. Are you going to be a part of this? Or are you going to get back into Scripture? Or are you going to judge everything by what the Scripture says? Please, I'm begging you. I'm begging you. If you hate me for what I say, at least study it for a day or two. And if you're a minister, you ought to be terrified. I know I am. And if you are a minister, you should not walk out of here full of fire, ready to stomp upon your people. Stomp upon yourself. Love your people. And they're not going to change and they're not going to reform by you taking these types of things to them on Sunday. They're going to change and they're going to reform as you properly interpret the Bible in book studies. 
I know that doesn't sound too glamorous. But they are going to change and reform as you preach your way through the Scriptures. But let me tell you something. Men have grown to have a tremendous ability of proper exegeting text and taking the blade off of it. They have learned how to speak in such a way as to make texts that are terrifyingly cutting. They've learned how to dull the edges so that they can be proper in their theology and in their exposition without rattling anyone. Well, we've said a lot here. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring this to an end. Someone says we ought to strike while the iron is hot. They told that to Spurgeon one day. He said, well, if God's the one heating the iron, it'll remain hot. I will not manipulate you and I will not coerce you. I will not tell you some story and I will not dim the lights and there will be, not, there will be no music. I will tell you this. If you just want to talk to me about stuff, I just I don't have time. But if you're troubled over your soul, I will stay here until sunrise tomorrow. If you're troubled over your soul, you don't know whether you're converted. You don't know whether you know Christ. You're struggling with sin. Then after this is over, just make your way just right over here and sit down and we'll talk. And if you can wait long enough, I'll talk to every one of you. I have no plans of going to Denny's. I have no plans of going to another church and boasting about how many people came forward. But we'll stay here all night. And there are other men that will. Amen. Young people, listen to me. Death is wrapping around you. In danger of losing your life. Please, no. No. Young men, don't become little boys in the ministry. Young men, listen to me. Do you know what your weapons of warfare are? I will tell you. The preaching of truth. Intercessory prayer. so that you tarry in the night watches. You're alone with God. And sacrificial love. Those are your weapons. You add anything else on and you've got Saul's armor. That's what you've got. The proclamation of truth through the foolishness of preaching. Intercessory prayer. You can fight with men because you have fought with God. And sacrifice for love. If you're going to preach, the only three weapons. You add, the more weapons you add, young men, let me tell you something. The less of the power and glory and majesty of God are you going to see. Give me a young man who will fight through the night in intercessory prayer. I don't care if he can't preach himself out of a wet paper sack. He'll have God's hand upon him. Someone asked an old prophet recently, what's the difference between the men of God of old days and the men of God today, even those that are popular? This is what he said. The men of God of old had the power of God on their life. The men of God today are really, really intelligent. Let's pray. Father, I pray that You would take this, this pitiful thing that You would work in the heart, especially of these young people. But if there's someone here who doesn't know You, that they will know You. 
there's someone here who does know you that struggles with assurance. I pray that somehow assurance would be granted to them. They would be strong in hope. Pray for the young Lord who wants to be ministers. Oh, dear God. Not marketing, Lord. Prayer. Prayer. Help them, God. Help them. Pray for the young girls here tonight. Beauty, simplicity, purity of heart. 